This morning's session examines national responses to homelessness. I'm sure all of you here know better than I do the problem that Australia is facing at the moment, and many will agree that a national plan to tackle the issue is necessary and, of course, desperately needed. It's something we've covered regularly on SBS, and I know looking, you're all looking forward to some fascinating analysis of media coverage in one of the sessions tomorrow in the plenary. Just a few extra notes. We know that in 2016, the census found that there were 116,000 Australians experiencing homelessness. That was a 14% increase on the previous five years. And specifically in New South Wales, that was a 37% jump, which is quite staggering. Obviously, we're here in Melbourne. Um, I'm a Melbourneian, and in the midst of winter, I think the issue of homelessness, and particularly rough sleepers, is more starkly presented to us. We know that in a, tw in a June 19 survey, we found that 392 rough sleepers existed in Melbourne, in the inner suburbs, 280, particularly in the Melbourne CBD. 42% of those rough sleepers were seeking public housing, and they're on the waiting list as we speak. More and more younger people, more and more older women are experiencing homelessness. Overwhelmingly though, almost 80% of those experiencing homelessness are men, and almost 80% are Australian born. The Department of Federal Housing, the Federal Department, has committed a billion dollars over four years to homelessness services. And here in Victoria, the state government has pledged 6,000 new housing units over the next five years. But of course, the issue goes beyond just housing to tackle the issues which cause homelessness, including mental health and domestic violence. Today, we'll investigate how we might be able to harness the collective energy and passion of those here today to drive forward a national campaign. Importantly, how you as a sector can gain the traction needed from our political leaders to show the leadership and develop the policies and invest money required to create real change. We're going to start with a short presentation from each panellist and following that I'll join them for a discussion on some of the major paths to reform on a national level. Your involvement of course is sought during the session. We'll be taking questions from the floor during our panel discussion later or you can of course submit a question to me via the conference app which I'm sure many of you have already downloaded and we'll try to include as many of those as possible. We'll also put an audience poll question to you after the presentation so make sure you have your conference app open and you just need to refresh it um, to make sure that those panel questions come up. But now let's hear from our first presenter. Can I welcome to the lectern Kate Colvin from the Council to Homeless Persons. Thanks, Sarah. I also want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respect to their elders, both past, present and emerging. I'm going to touch on just three issues. Firstly, the growing rate of homelessness and the reason for it. Second, what government has been doing about it. And third, what this means for all of us. So as Sarah indicated, homelessness increased 14% between 2011 and 2016. Now one in 200 Australians, that's 116,000 people, are homeless on any given night. 40% of those are under 25 and almost one in three are working. So it's no longer a problem that's just limited to people who are struggling on Centrelink incomes. It's a pretty sorry set of statistics for one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So why, we ask, is this happening? The simple fact is that our housing market is broken. There are too few rentals that are available at the low cost end of the rental market and too many people who are fiercely competing for those properties. That means rents, particularly for relatively cheaper properties, are rising faster than incomes. Those least able to compete are pushed out. They're forced into homelessness simply because they can't find a home that they can afford. So we've got lack of low-cost rentals both creating more homelessness and it makes the job of ending homelessness for people more difficult. There are just too few housing exit points for people in temporary or crisis accommodation. And so that means we have a bottleneck. With people stuck in temporary options long term, leaving less emergency accommodation available for those who are newly homeless. And that's why turnaway rates are increasing, it's why rough sleeping is increasing, and it's why overcrowding and all the other forms of homelessness are also increasing. So I want to pause here and acknowledge 
that this is not just about numbers. I want to acknowledge the devastation that this causes for real people. The crushing stress experienced by people who need help only to be turned away or to learn that the only option is a rooming house. And the frustration and heartbreak felt by the many of you whose job it is to tell people that there are simply no housing options. So the picture we have here on the screen is people who have to wait for an appointment. Um, many of them won't be able to have one. They might need to come back the next day. As you can see, the profile of those people waiting is many women with children. So we have a crisis and what we ask have our federal political leaders <coughs> been doing about it. So it's now been 11 years since homelessness was last seriously on the political agenda in the lead into the 2007 election. Following this election, the new Rudd government created the Road Home Strategy and funded a new national partnership agreement on homelessness. It was a bright time with a new agreement trialling smart new approaches. But at the same time, a great opportunity was missed with a new national affordable housing agreement created that didn't have the investment needed to grow social housing. So the government delivered the resources for support and effective new ways of using it and failed to invest in the most powerful tool to end homelessness, social housing. It's kind of like making a cake without flour something that my daughter did recently when she used the tablespoon measure instead of the cup measure. <laughs> and the results, I can tell you, were like our housing crisis, pretty awful. <laughs> but back in 2008, the deep structural flaw created by not investing in social housing was hidden for some years, because in 2008, the Labor government gave social housing a one-off injection of $500 million following the global financial crisis. This 500 million and the National Rental Affordability Scheme, another new Labor initiative, led to a brief period in which social housing as a proportion of all housing grew. And that had tangible impacts. Rough sleeping declined. Presentations to emergency departments by people who were homeless declined. And housing opportunities opened up for people who were on low incomes. But then the social housing initiative ran its course social housing growth stopped. People on low incomes were again at the mercy of the flawed fundamentals of our housing market. The fact that we have too few low-cost rental properties is a direct result of flawed government policy. So partly we have housing tax policy that's failed to stimulate investment into affordable rental housing and partly we have a failure of government to invest in social housing. And then, more recently, to add insult to the injury of these housing fundamentals that are actually guaranteed to lead to increased homelessness, the coalition government has pursued policies that have directly increased homelessness. So while they have to be commended for providing ongoing funding to the National Partnership Agreement on Homelessness, this commitment has sadly been a small bright spot in a wide sea of darkness. The current government have cut resources to housing and accommodation, which as I mentioned before are both critical to ending homelessness. $80 million in annual funding for crisis accommodation. $322 million in annual funding for remote Indigenous housing. And they discontinued the National Rental Affordability Scheme. Added to that, they've launched a series of attacks on social security that mean more people have no income. And They've done next to nothing to address other drivers of family violence, like to address family violence or other drivers of homelessness. And so here we are. We arrive at the current day in a pretty dark place. We as a sector are already overwhelmed with demand, and yet we know, if we're realistic, that we're facing a homelessness crisis that's only going to worsen. We have, many of us, advocated for a different approach but sadly we've gone backwards anyway. And so now we're at a turning point. We have to think of new ways of making our voice heard. Sometimes feels like we're powerless, but the reality is that we're not. All of our services, our allies, we have phenomenal reach into the community. Each organisation has community supporters, business, sector allies, some have hundreds of staff and volunteers, 
and these people are all voters. And we are approaching an election in which every vote will count. So this is a form of power that we can use. And in addition to these supporters, we also have passion and vision. Most homeless organisations were created with a vision for a world in which homelessness wasn't just managed, but where it was ended. So this is our moment. We have to turn those visions into reality, to take the heartbreak that we as a sector feel, as workers feel, standing in the face of homelessness without the housing tools we need to end it, and to let that heartbreak become anger, and then to turn that anger into action. But we have to be smart about it. We have to use these tools that we have as effectively as we can. The Everybody's Home campaign is about powering up our many efforts into a single powerful movement for change. It's based on research about community views on the housing crisis and how to bring people on board. It's using the best campaign tools that are available for mobilising the community. And it's also about solutions that are about ending homelessness. These solutions are not about getting a tablespoon of flour when we know we need a cup. We're calling for 500,000 social and affordable rental homes based on research by Ahuri housing economist Judy Yates. This is the amount we know we need through to 2036 to deliver affordable housing opportunities for people on low incomes. So with that amount of housing, um, low income workers and those not in work will have housing options that mean they don't become homeless. And if they do, then as a sector we'll be able to find a place for them. The Everybody's Home campaign also calls for a national plan to end homelessness to address other drivers of homelessness like family violence and income security and to ensure young people and others get the support that they need. So you're all invited to get on board and be a part of a, a powerful effort to put all of our shoulders to the one wheel and work together. I don't have time now for all the details about how you can be involved. We'll be, si we'll be talking those through at the sunrise session tomorrow, but I want to finish by summarising what I'm saying. This mess that we face of increasing homelessness has been created by flawed government policy and it can be fixed by adopting the solutions we're calling for. But if that's going to happen, we can't sit idly by. We all have to be part of the fight for change. I hope now we're going to hear some decent solutions from leaders now in opposition who've been hearing our calls for change already. And finally, before I conclude, I once again ask you and all your organisations to throw your weight behind the Everybody's Home campaign to unite our voices and together to end homelessness in Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, and I certainly think that does set, set the mood, I think, not just for the next two days, but certainly for this session in particular. Well, I'd like to please welcome to the stage now Senator Doug Cameron. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, in which we meet the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to thank the co-chairs of the conference, Jenny uh, Smith and Michael Fotheringham, uh, for their invitation uh, to participate in today's panel, and a welcome uh, thanks to Sarah, Kate, Tony and Lee. I don't want to squander uh, my time with you this, this morning telling you what you already know uh, or repeating what you've heard when I've pre previously addressed conferences like this. Uh, you're aware uh, of what the 2016 census and other sources have revealed about the trajectory of homelessness in this country and which groups are being dis disproportionately impacted. You also know what Labour achieved when we were last in government with regards to housing and homelessness. 
Uh, you know about the Coalition's appalling track record since 2013, and you're aware of the significant commitments Labour has been making in this space. We will have more to say uh, on the housing and homelessness crisis before the next election. From Labour's perspective, very few developments in recent years are as deeply troubling as the growing number of our fellow Australians experiencing homelessness. We've made a point of calling it a crisis. That's because we understand the profound life-altering impact homelessness can have and that these impacts run, run counter to Labour's inherent commitment to social justice. We know homelessness drives and exacerbates poor outcomes in physical and mental health, reduces educational attainment and economic participation, and increases social isolation. Just as importantly, we are mindful that the social and economic costs of homelessness are not only borne by the individuals who experience it, but also by their families, their communities, our nation as a whole, and it's a heavy toll that spans generations. Labour also recognises that homelessness is both an outcome and a driver of inequality. If we are to be meaningfully addressing homelessness, it will require recognising this fundamental truth and addressing it in all of our policy responses. Inequality is the crux of the issue, and I'd like to concentrate the bulk of my remaining remarks to the intersection of inequality, housing and homelessness. Three reports re released just last week by ACOS, Mission Australia and the University of Melbourne's HILDA survey all reached the same conclusion. Inequality of wealth and income is widening in this country, particularly between younger and older Australians. And this has the potential to diminish and radically reshape our society in years to come. The reports note that the falling rates of home ownership, increased rental stress, worsening housing affordability and flatlining income growth are putting immense pressure on the housing choices available to vulnerable Australians. The HILDA survey found that measures of inequality within the youth cohort uh, that it tracks has worsened significantly and that this is inextricably linked to home ownership. Just one example that illustrates this alarming trend is that between 2001 and 2004, 13.5% of renters between the ages of 18 and 24 became home owners. From 2013 to 2016, however, just over 7% made the same transition. And there is evidence that income diversity in this cohort shrank markedly, with fewer people from poorer backgrounds represented. Roger Wilkins Hilda, Hilda's lead author, uh, has echoed the analysis of Professor Duncan McLennan and made the following assessment, and I quote, I think decline in home ownership is a very big concern that has a very strong link to growing evidence of intergenerational inequality. This marked increase in inequality greatly concerns Labour. That's because this trend may see us begin to mirror less equal societies, which in turn will see our communities become more economically segregated. A case in point is the United States, where there is a growing recognition that working class people in, uh, experience entrenched inequality uh, of housing opportunity with fewer and fewer areas available to live. That's because as inequality goes up and housing markets become more expensive, the number of locations with affordable dwellings available to them becomes smaller. This becomes a self-perpetuating cycle because as Richard Reeves of the Brookings Institute argues in his book Dream Hoarders, there is a strong body of research that shows where people live impact their access to good schools, jobs and health care. As geographic segregation of high and low income households become more severe, it reinforces inequality across generations. 
While we often hear about inclusionary zoning, we are only just starting to understand the impact of exclusionary zoning here in Australia. In the US in particular, exclusionary zoning is used to protect the house values, schools and communities uh, within affluent areas at the expense of the disadvantaged. Reeves observes that zoning becomes ex exclusionary when it operates simply to separate households based on their economic resources. Exclusionary zoning has adversely distorted the US housing market and unless it is challenged here in Australia, the same will occur within our communities. As the then President Barack Obama noted in 2015, what used to be racial segregation now mirrors itself in class segregation. I'm afraid to say there is growing evidence that we are in danger of heading down this path of class segregation. Rhetorical responses such as equality of opportunity and the best form of welfare is a job ignores the reality of many disadvantaged Australians living in low socioeconomic communities. Nicholas Biddle from the ANU has pointed out that the 2016 census demonstrates Australia also has a significant geographic concentrations of income distribution. Wealthier people in Australia tend to live in neighbourhoods with other wealthier people and access to greater amenity. Poorer people are also more likely to live in close proximity to people who share their disadvantage. Parents living in social and economic exclusion cannot provide equality of opportunity or the employment opportunities to their children readily available to well-heeled bankers and barristers living in, the man in their mansions in their leafy suburbs. Anglicare's 2018 rental affordability snapshot points to the increasing social disaggregation of our cities and communities. The snapshot reveals that for a single person on the minimum wage in Greater Sydney, there were just 41 dwellings available to them without experiencing rental stress, with 39 more than 20, with, with 39 more than 20 kilometres from the city centre. For many of those on income support, there was no affordable housing in Greater Sydney. As communities of disadvantaged are forced by a lack of housing opportunity uh, to cluster, the stressors that can contribute to people experiencing homelessness become more prevalent. The implications for the homeless are dire. Regret regrettably, the seriousness of these developments and the challenge that we are facing appear utterly lost on Malcolm Turnbull and the coalition government. If it wasn't lost, you'd have someone here from our government, surely. Next month, will mark five years since the election of the Abbott government, an unedifying anniversary, because it also marked the beginning of an unrelenting assault inspired by trickle-down economics on working and middle-class Australians. It's seen, it's seen them attack our social compact, and in doing so, harm the most vulnerable Australians and worsen inequality. The coalition's record speaks for itself. Cuts to schools, universities, TAFE, vocational training, hospitals, GP rebates, paid parental leave, pensioners, carers, people with disabilities and childcare. Signalling to the Fair Work Commission that penalty rates should be cut. It's no surprise they don't want to come here and talk to the people that deal with the fallout of this day in, day out in their working lives. There's been an unwavering commitment in their community to austerity, as they have been shifting the tax burden away from the top end of town. Whether it was their aborted plan to increase the regressive GST, or handing tax powers to the states, or enacting enormous tax cuts for the wealthiest Australians, or seeking to hand over $80 billion to multinational and big banks, inequality couldn't be further from their minds. Labour will take a different approach. We want to build a more egalitarian society, 
to make sure where you're born doesn't become the key determinant of where, you're, where you end up in life. Labour recognises that tackling Australia's homelessness and housing affordability crisis will require strong national leadership and policies that are strongly informed by an equity and fairness agenda. This commitment is evident in our plans to make meaningful investments in schools, universities, vocational training, hospitals and healthcare, or what can be broadly called our social infrastructure. That's because we recognise that only by addressing the root causes of inequality will we achieve genuine progress in reducing homelessness. We want and need to build a more egalitarian society. Now, I think most of you would know the policies that we've outlined. I'm, I'll be happy to take uh, questions on this, but I want to thank you uh, for your time this morning and for your determination to build a good society and your advocacy on behalf of disadvantaged Australians who cannot access housing and end up homelessness. I look forward to the panel discussion. I look forward to a change in government. I look forward to a cabinet that can actually understand the issues affecting the homeless, affecting working class Australians, and not simply rely on trickle-down economics as your one fundamental economic policy. It's time for a change. It's time to go back to where we were with the road home and to start dealing with the issue of housing and homelessness. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator Cameron. You certainly mentioned a raft of social measures there, which we look forward to exploring in our discussion session. We will soon be there, but lastly, let's hear from Senator Lee Rhiannon. Uh, th thanks very much. I do acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay tribute to their history, their culture, and their ongoing contributions to our communities. And thanks to the organisers for the invitation to join you today. Uh, and I was told that there's about 800 people here, more than 800, which uh, is fantastic and indicative of the need to really address this issue in detail and in, in time and quick time and homelessness. Um, I'm pleased to share the panel, particularly with Kate and Doug. Doug and I have known each other, as Kate and I have known each other for a long time. Um, but I think Doug and I have probably set a few records in the Senate, moving many motions on housing uh, together. Uh, and I give emphasis to the together because having cooperation between progressive forces on the housing issue is absolutely vital. Uh, we've worked closely with Labor on housing because we believe that this cooperation is essential. A united front has never been more important, I would say, to generating the solidarity we need to end homelessness. On that note, the Greens warmly welcome the Everybody's Home campaign. Uniting so many organisations around a common list of demands takes serious energy and commitment. It was a huge achievement to pull that off. I congratulate Kate and everybody involved in it. Um, also, since taking, I've only had the housing portfolio since um, the 2016 election. I was very pleased to pick it up. Uh, and what's particularly impressed with me is the um, commitment, the re really strong um, passion that so many bring to this issue. Um, in, uh, within the Greens, over the past um, about eight months, we've had 40 meetings with our, we're very much um, based on local groups, 40 meetings with a range of local groups and again, that commitment for answers and a real desire to actually get moving on this issue, you can really feel. Where I'll start for my talk today is with a proposal that some may find controversial. I'll just give it out an, um, initially and then come back to it. And that is that everyone, including Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, should be eligible for public housing. So I'll come back to that. Now, we're all familiar with the current state of housing. It's been well outlined by our previous speakers. Homelessness numbers are increasing. 
Um, public housing is shrinking and I pay tribute to the people, many of you would have seen them, I picked up one of their leaflets when I came in, really taking on the whole issue of public housing because of what's happening in Melbourne at the moment. And then housing affordability, again as speakers have identified, is dominated by the marketplace. And you start to wonder how can we have a solution when housing is stuck in the private marketplace. So, so although there is much tremendous positive work in the housing sector, overall I feel we are losing. Now, I'm actually a very positive person and I found, find trouble saying that and I thought about it before I used that term at a, um, at a conference like this. Now, I do not mean to dismiss the efforts by so many people and groups and I'm certainly not dismissing it dismissing that work. Of course, our situation would be far worse, for example, if we hadn't raised such an outcry in our communities and in Parliament at rumours of cuts to the National Affordable Housing Agreement last year. But we need to ask ourselves, how do we get on the front foot? How can we not only defend against cuts, but achieve wide-ranging and durable reforms? How can we ensure no one is homeless and guarantee housing affordability and security for everyone? Now, I think the, it starts by questioning various assumptions. Assumptions are often just part of our work and sometimes we don't notice them, but sometimes they're really worth just looking at. Now, a good example of an, an assumption we should be critiquing, I think, is contained in one of the questions that is in the background to this panel. One of the questions put to us is, how will they ensure people have adequate income to pay for housing? I'm sure most people here know that about 300,000 people sought homelessness assistance last year. Now imagine if our public schools charged compulsory fees and 300,000 children were turned away from the classroom in one year because they didn't have a paid invoice. Would we design some sort of voucher scheme, a means-tested tax break, or set up temporary crisis schools? Would we be asking how we can ensure people have adequate income so their children can attend our public schools? No. No, we wouldn't do that. We recognise education is a human right. We'd make education free. We, we've made for education free. We build the schools and train the teachers. We do what, what it took to ensure no child was turfed out of a classroom because they couldn't afford to pay. So perhaps a better question to ask is how can we ensure that people have a home regardless of their ability to pay? Yes, in practice, our social welfare system means most people have some money coming in most of the time. But it's a principle that counts. Housing is a human right, and human rights should not depend on one's ability to pay. I accept that housing and education are different. I also accept that the user pays logic is much more ingrained in housing. However, the principle remains important. I believe it is, and it, it is very important that we remember that principle. People love Medicare and our public school system. They are open to everyone, but even if someone has private health insurance or sends their kids to a private school, chances are they support and probably strongly support a public health care and a public education system. It's very difficult to cut funding for these institutions and there are consistent and strong demands to increase funding for them because everybody's got skin in the game. Now, I believe we should, could propose a similar institution for housing. That would mean a massive investment in social housing, allowing everyone to stay in their home unconditionally and allow everyone to apply for a home. Yes, everyone, even Turnbull. Just like how Medicare and our public school system is available to everyone. If your children live in Turak or Potts Point, they can go to the public school. Now, if a household can pay, that's great. They'll be charged a proportion, a proportion of income as rent. If they can't pay for a while because they get sick or lose their job, that's also okay. They'll be given time to get back on their feet. Creating universal social housing schemes in every state and territory could be the Medicare 
for the 21st century. Now, the Queensland Greens proposed exactly that in the 2017 state election campaign. One million new social, social homes over 30 years and everyone should be able to apply. They did the costings on it, people loved it. And it was easy to understand and the potential benefits were tangible. At that election, the Greens won their first seat in Maywa with 28% of the vote, and they nearly won a second seat with 11.7% swing, taking us to 34.4% of the primary vote in South Brisbane. Now, why I share those figures with you is purely to show that people were excited about a universal housing scheme. They got it, and they wanted to hear more. Now, this recent electoral uh, success shows how, how receptive our audience is to these initiatives. Universal housing scheme, I would argue, that let's consider its time has come. Um, and what we're doing here, it's not simply attempts to make the market less brutal, but we're talking about a scheme which radically redefines what it means for housing to be a human right. Now, of course, this is not a new idea. Social housing programs, which are practically open to everyone, exist in Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, the UK, Finland. And interestingly, if you look at the Commonwealth State Housing Agreements after the Second World War, what Australia had at that time isn't that dissimilar. Now, I think most, most of you here agree on the need for a big increase in social housing investment. But how do we generate the political will to make it happen? We need to give everyone skin in the game by making social housing universal. In an article in the US publication Jacobin, Robbie Nelson um, argues how this can be achieved. And I want to share some of the US experience with you. He explains how a universal social housing program could be, his words, an engine of solidarity. He goes on to say, meager, means-tested social programs don't win broad-based support. A large body of research and a cursory look at opinion polling indicates that universal programs like Medicare and Social Security are the most consistently popular and the most difficult to erode legislatively. Now, Nelson's words, I think, are most relevant for our approach to housing in Australia. Also, just staying with the US experience, in that country, there is an extensive debate going on about universal housing and universal health at the moment. And there are interesting parallels between these. Now, this is some work from the People's, Pro uh, People's Policy Project. Um, now, they're, they're looking at a... Uh, um, there's a lot of talk about a proposal for government-run universal Medicare for all insurance program. And that's gaining wide, uh, widespread public support. Now, side by side with that is also analysis of universal housing. And this People's Policy Project argued that the US needs 10 million public housing dwellings to be built. Now, these are their words. The scheme should be based on universalist principles with the aim of moving towards a housing model with no means testing. I share those with you, those experiences, naming the countries in Europe and what the debate is in the US, to show that what we're talking about isn't some pie in the sky, out there radical position. It is actually happening now in some countries. In addition to the potential political benefits, a universal scheme which brings in households on higher incomes can also potentially close the funding gap. Professor Jenny Stewart at the University of New South Wales argues against tight eligibility criteria. These are her words. Restricting public housing to those most in need may seem morally satisfying, but over time it leads to poorer outcomes, financial and social. Housing supply is more constrained than it would otherwise be because a housing authority's budget loses income from tenants paying higher rents and the possibilities for inclusion provided by tenants who are employed are lost. Now, I also want to share with you some of the work of the, from the United Nations Research, Research Institute for Social Development. Their report on combating inequality and poverty is very informative for this debate. 
The report argue, a recent report from that institute, argues that a universal approach to the provision of social service makes it more likely that they become durable and transformative schemes. The report has information from a campaigning perspective, and these are their words. Universalism is grounded in the principles of solidarity and citizenship. It can foster social cohesion and build coalitions across classes, groups, and generations. So they're the words from the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. Now, I think this is the key. It will be very difficult to end homelessness without a massive boost to social housing. And it will be very difficult to achieve the political will for that boost. And I obviously prefer that Labor wins and the Coalition win. I spend a lot of my time being critical of the Coalition. But even for Labor, it's going to be difficult to tackle a lot of this and a universal scheme would make it so much easier for them and all of us. So it would be very difficult to achieve the political will for that boost without everyone having skin in the game. We must ensure that when crisis services are cut or when social housing is sold off, it's not a slight against them. It's an affront against all of us. We need an engine of solidarity. I would argue that that means universal social housing. Fantastic to be with you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Lirianna. Now we do only have less than half an hour for the um, panel discussion, so let's just jump. Straight, in, straight into it. Before we delve further into the issues, because there have been quite a few that have been raised by our presenters, I'm interested in hearing from you. I've had quite a number of questions come through, so thank you very much for those people already submitting questions. But let's conduct our audience poll question for this session right now. If I ask you to open your conference app and go to the live polling session, while you do that, we'll bring the question up on the screen, so you'll be able to see that around the room now. If it's not coming up on your homepage, by the way, once you're in the app, just hit the cog and hit refresh, and that question will pop up. All right, now the question is, in recent years, Australian governments have, A, done a great job in responding to homelessness, B, devoted some resources but not enough to reduce homelessness, C, not done enough. Lack of policy direction and leadership is contributing to the rise in homelessness. Now you have 10 seconds to plug in your answer, so get those fingers going <laughs> as we start the countdown clock. Okay, fingers away from your devices. <laughs> well, I think we have a majority here. What do we reckon? <laughs> Although it's fluctuating. <laughs> I like that this keeps yeah, dancing exactly. around. <laughs> okay, so it's fair to say that not many are very happy with policies recently. Is that, is that fair enough? <laughs> oh, this disappeared. But anyway, look, obviously the, the main uh, response there came to C, not done enough. A lack of policy direction and leadership is contributing to the rise in homelessness. Now, we've heard a number of, of, implement, of, of policies that um, our panellists would like implemented by the government and if they were elected into government themselves. The housing affordability issue is a massive one. Essentially though, how do we grow housing? How do we grow social housing? I mean, we know it's a, there's, there's federal elements to it, but there, a lot of it is based on state governments as well. So um, I guess I'll start with you, Kate. How do you think we can actually grow housing? One of the things that's really consistent is that we can't grow social housing without a subsidy. So the market conditions, land is just too expensive for um, anyone to really invest in housing for people on the lowest incomes. So um, really need a, a federal subsidy. I mean, the feds have the lion's share of the resources, um, which can then be used to leverage state governments to also put money on the table. And I think someone said, never stand in the way of a premier and a bucket of money. I think it's fair to say that if the federal government put resources on the table and asked the states to contribute um, that um, they would have a sort of double your money kind of option. So that's really, I'd say, the number one preference is to have a federal subsidy that the states also contribute to and to have that drive social housing growth. 
We know, of course, that um, a number of social security changes are obviously important. Um, Senator Cameron, you mentioned a few social security measures or social measures that you would put in place if you're elected. I think it's important to note, though, that during um, in, in the previous Labor government, the last Labor government, we saw that some of the New Start payments were, were tightened and that it was difficult for parents to get, out, get the New Start payment once their youngest child turned eight. The current government's policies have exasperated that situation and compounded the effects on people perhaps increasing their level of homelessness. What can you actually do, you know, when we're talking about schemes and parental payment, how do you increase it? Is that, is that something that you, you know, further tax? How do you actually do that? Well, all governments make mistakes uh, and <laughs> Labor governments are no different. We made a mistake, in my view, uh, in relation to some of those areas. Uh, we've indicated we will do a thorough review of Newstart. I think there's a clear commitment from our um, finance uh, and economic team that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, uh, we were in government, we gave the biggest single increase uh, in the pension. So we are aware of how important, uh, you know, social security payments are to build a decent society in this country. Uh, we've indicated we'll stop negative gearing in capital gains tax and it will only apply to new housing to increase the stock. So that is billions of dollars that, uh, that allow us to deal with some of the other issues. Uh, all these areas in terms of economics and fiscal policy are connected. So we will look at all of the, the issues. The, my concern and, and some of the discussions that we've had is we've got 4.7% density for social and public housing at the moment. You know, when I was brought up in what we called the schemes in Scotland, I think it was well over, you know, 30%. And in those schemes, uh, you know, you had tradespeople, you had clerical workers, blue collar workers, white collar workers, police, ambulance, you had a community. My big, biggest concern, and one that I've always had, is that uh, the public housing system is now the, the housing of last resort. And all of the problems, all community problems, you know, the, uh, the issues of uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, family violence, intergenerational unemployment are all congregated in those areas. So I do agree that public housing is important as well, but public housing and community housing uh, working together is the only way forward with, you know, a compassionate approach, a realistic approach on social security payments in this country is essential. I'm going to go to one of the questions that's been submitted um, by this forum, and I thank you for that. In essentially, the question's asking, how do you intend to engage the business community in a constructive and unified way? Obviously, everyone in this room wants to see an increase in housing and wants to end homelessness. How do you involve the people who have the, the money to back such solutions? Anyone can answer that. Yeah, I, look, I've I got to tell you, I, uh, I am having an absolute battle with the uh, um, industry super funds at the moment. Because I think the industry super funds with trillions of dollars available to them uh, should be uh, making sure that they do what they're doing. I mean, Australian industry funds are investing in social housing in the UK. They're investing in social housing in the States. They should be doing it here. And one of the main issues that I'm raising with them is that, you know, sure, there is this, uh, you know, issue called the sole purpose test. Uh, but the sole purpose test is to make sure you get your, your members have got a roof over their head. You know, and I think that's part of the sole, sole purpose test. So there's big discussions I'm having with them. And another, which is not a corporate area, but I've been uh, talking to a lot of the faith-based groups about how you know, we can access some of the land that is not being used as effectively as it could by the, uh, by the religious groups around the country. They can get a, you know, a return on that. It becomes more effective for them and we can build more houses. So I think the super funds, the banks are now looking to rehabilitate themselves. They are talking to me as well. And uh, so we get the super funds, the banks, the religious groups, uh, the state governments, there's not much land in the federal government area, but if we can get them together, we can make a big difference in the context of availability and pricing, because the lower we can get the costs, 
the more effective we can get it. But you know, business uh, are about profits. Business uh, are not about these issues, and it's a big task, but we are prepared to take it up. So continued lobbying is the short answer to that? Um, well, <laughs> Across the board, really. Uh, I, think I, I, just, I don't think lobbying is what I would call it. I think we've got to use the power and influence of government to make sure that they do the right thing. Simple. Senator Rihanna, you mentioned um, univer a universal housing scheme in the notes um, when you spoke. I guess if we delve a bit deeper into the topic there, what about addressing the actual issues for people with more complex needs? You know, we're talking about domestic violence here, we're talking about mental and physical disability, perhaps alcohol and drug abuse. How do you address those issues which are contributing factors to homelessness? Uh, look, there clearly needs to be an expansion of services for them. But again, what we know and the experience shows us time and time again, when people have a home, uh, that they've uh, got that stability where they can rebuild their lives. And it's also so often easier for those groups who provide the services to be able to access people um, because they know where they live, they can um, build up the programs, the um, relationships, etc. So it really is the way to proceed. But I did also want to go back to um, the question that went to Doug about the private sector. That uh, firstly, um, we need to be aware, like in terms of what I was speaking about in terms of universal housing, it's not about wiping out the private housing market. There clearly is a role for that. But it's not just not allowed to continue to dominate. And those examples that I gave from Europe, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, 20 to 30% of their housing stock is in, the, is in the, uh, the public sector. That's actually very healthy and would actually help, if we had that, help stop the spikes that we're now seeing within the private housing market that causes a lot of people who have just gone in and have big mortgages a lot of problems. So how we handle the, the private sector, we really need to give attention to. But also how we're planning, and we will be taking this forward in the election, is a federal housing trust. Federal Housing Trust is really a bond aggregator, and this is again where private companies, they could invest in that way, but it doesn't mean that they're using the market. Like, I'd be really wary for the housing, our housing sector and for governments just to be relying on the private, house, uh, the private sector um, because that's where it could get very distorted. We need to have a healthy public housing sector that isn't just residualising the communities that are already doing it so tough. Kate, um, you, you obviously advocate for uh, making more housing available, as we've all heard um, today. You all make that point quite clearly. I think you're on the coalface, you know, at the front line. Ha these contributing factors that lead to homelessness, how prevalent are they and how quickly can somebody spiral into that scenario? Oh, enormously quickly. Uh, it comes up, I've, I've been, as I mentioned, I think that I've done about 40 of these housing meetings. And one of the figures I get, give is, you know, that there's a couple of million people in housing stress and then explain what housing stress is. You know, your kids get sick, you lose your job, you have to look after your elderly parents, um, you get sacked from work. All of a sudden, that you are, your whole circumstances are changed. You may not be able to pay the rent, you know, it may not be able to pay the mortgage. You're on that slippery slope then to um, the situation that a lot of people have not imagined that they, they will be in. They think that's just about other people, people they see sitting in the street. Uh, and so it is, I think it's, um, it's very real for people coming from Sydney where our housing prices are shocking, rents are out of control. I just find I work with a lot of young people, we've got a, a young Greens, Hearing their talk is so different from, I come from a poor working class family and I was able to buy a home when I was quite young. Um, these kids from middle class families, working class families, it's just not on their radar. They just look at, look at things that it's pretty tough, it's pretty ruthless. But as we know as well with affordable housing being an issue, the, that's generally orientated towards low paid workers and not generally affordable to people on Centrelink benefits who are the majority of homelessness. Well that's, well, that's why, you know, the decision uh, by the coalition to uh, create a bond aggregator was a good decision. Uh, we had a policy on that long before the government uh, made, uh, made that decision. We didn't have to go on a jaunt to London to know that the bond <laughs> aggregator was a good thing. You can just read it. You read the hoorie. You know, you look at their reports and you don't have to go to London and come back and make an announcement. Uh, but the issue of the, uh, the funding gap is huge uh, and that's why I want, want to continue uh, to jawbone the uh, industry funds, the, the uh, banks, 
uh, and industry generally because anyone can invest in this bond aggregator. It's a, it would make a better than bond return. Uh, we've got super funds investing in bonds at the moment. So this would give us an opportunity to get the funding in. Uh, I then think one of the key issues is that the, um, the community housing sector themselves uh, do a bit of rationalization, do a bit of amalgamation so that we can get the, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, bigger players with a bigger capacity to build, a bigger capacity to use the funding in the bond aggregator to build more homes. So these are uh, uh, <coughs> issues we will be making an announcement uh, before the next election about uh, how we deal with that funding gap because that, you know, the, the bond aggregator on its own is an insufficient initiative to actually get down that housing continuum to the you know, low income, the working poor, and social security recipients. Government needs to intervene. And, and if we don't intervene, then the bond aggregator might be fine if you've got you know, a, a middle class working family that can afford to buy <coughs> or, or rent in the community housing sector, <laughs> it won't help the working poor. So that is an absolutely essential proposition. Kate, I'd like to come to you next, because I think um, obviously we find in the CBDs across the country, um, facilities more readily available in, that den in those densely populated areas. But one of the questions that's come in here is, is there a regional solution? Is that one of the options? Decentralise the industry, create jobs, affordable property, and revitalising communities? life and um, our you know we're, we're human persons that relate to the people around us so you can't just move people from mm -hmm. pillar to post they're sort of rooted in their community with their family with their people that they're connected to with the services perhaps that they're connected to so we often get this idea um, in how do we quickly fix the homelessness problem of why don't we just move people onto cheaper land and the problem is probably broader in the sense that our our cities are sort of becoming, you know, like donuts where you have these um, jobs just in the centre and, and cheap housing on the fringe without transport access to jobs. So really if you move people to just cheaper locations, and the same goes with regional areas that are affordable, they tend to be places where there's few jobs so and also few services. So if we move people to those locations, we really don't give people the um, opportunity to to get ahead in life, to participate in those jobs, but also really importantly, you know, you really can destroy someone's life by moving them away from their family, from their friends, from everything that's important to them. Can, can I just make, <coughs> make a point on that? When I came to Australia in 1973, I first lived at the Endeavour Hostel in South Coogee. Uh, I wanted to get out, out, out of the hostel as quickly as I could, uh, but at least that was a support mechanism. We hear much you know, all these attacks on migrants being the problem in this, this community. I think there's a, a growing incidence of racism in this country that is a real worry. Uh, you know, when I came, uh, I, I firstly you know, lived in the, in the hostel. I then got some local jobs, but I was paying, I think I was earning $87 a week, but I was paying $50 <laughs> for my a flat in Rainbow Street in Kingsford. And uh, you know, I thought, I, I have to get out of here. Luckily, there was a job available in Musselbrook at Liddell Power Station. And if they want to keep that keep a crap going for another 15 years, good luck. Uh, but um, I, was a, I was a maintenance fitter there for seven years. I actually got out and went into the regions. But the jobs are just not there. The jobs are predominantly being created within a 10 kilometer radius of the CBD. That's how modern economies, whether we like it or not, are working. And for Barnaby Joyce to say move to Armadale just <laughs> demonstrates what a fool this guy is. All right, that's, that's enough of that. <laughs> we do have, I mean, we're about to finish this session, sadly, but I might just quickly open. We've got some roving mics. I'm sure I'm getting lots of questions in here on the iPad, but I'm sure there are many more. If anyone wants to put their hand up and ask a question, we'll try and get a mic to you very quickly. Might maybe just down here, if we could, please. Hi, 
Hi, I'm looking forward to the day that you're not shadow housing the mystery you're actually housing us. <laughs> Um, I, I'm one of the supported um, lived experience people. Thank you, Ahuri, for having me here today. Uh, I'm asking about housing cooperatives and how they fit in the proposed mix from the Greens and from the Labor government for a future of sustainable housing, uh, affordable housing, pathways into home ownership, and most importantly, a form of social housing which fosters upward social mobility, people who live there, independence and um, has you know proven well-being and um, community um, positive ramifications. So would you be interested in fostering that model and um, investing in that model and do you know why it hasn't been more invested in given that it seems to be such a great model working well across the country and internationally? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, you know, since I've been the Shadow Minister for Housing and Homelessness, I've learnt one thing. Do not rule any uh, initiative out. There has to be a range of initiatives uh, that we should look at. And, uh, you know, cooperatives work well. Uh, cooperatives are good, but I don't think cooperatives will have the scale to resolve the, uh, the housing affordability or the homelessness issue on, its, on their own. So th they are part of a mix. I, w I would not rule out managed investment trust being able to build uh, in areas, but there'll need to be sort of checks and balances uh, put on them. I think share ownership is, is another area that's that, that we can build on. I just take the view, rule nothing out. This is a crisis, and we need to, to get as many good minds and as much funding and as much effort politically that we can get into this area. You don't do it without a housing minister. You don't do it without a minister for homelessness. Because I know what it's like, it's too easy in government for you know the, the, the other big portfolios to grab everything and you get nothing for housing and homelessness. That is a big challenge. And now I think Labour has, has recognised that housing and homelessness is not just a social issue, it's a huge economic issue, and when you deal, it, deal with it as both an economic imperative as well as a social imperative, you start getting people thinking different. So I rule nothing out. I think all those areas are important. We need to do everything in government we possibly can to increase housing stock and get a roof over people's heads. Thanks very much for raising the question. The cooperative um, system has a fine history in Australia and the universal housing um, program that we um, outlined, we certainly see that it would have a mix. It would um, emergency housing, cooperative, local government as well as state government could all apply for funding to get uh, various, ho various housing schemes going. So it would certainly fit in and it needs to be part of the mix. Any other questions? From our audience, there's one just at the back there, just by the. By the Hi, Jonathan from uh, West Australia. So we were a small group of homeless that went to the federal um, housing and homeless inquiry in 2014, and the outcome of the actual inquiry itself um, produced 40 points from the Senate to the actual government itself, but the government only accepted nine of them. Um, many of them were actually pretty distinctive and they were actually um, sorting out housing and homelessness. And that was with the uh, then Senator Scott Ludlam and uh, Sue Lyons for Labor. But what's the point in actually talking to the federal government if they're just not going to listen? Um, well, look, I think you, I, mean, I, I say you've got to engage with government because you know, this mob that are in now are so divorced from the struggles of ordinary working class Australians, that the, every opportunity you get, you should be saying to your local member and to ministers, these are the problems. I mean, this seat should have had uh, you know, a coalition minister sitting there explaining why they are so incompetent and so uncaring. That's oh, that's a bit view. unfair. They, they, did, they did accept to be here. It's a clash of calendars. Oh, and <laughs> And they have committed funding to this area. So, as we know, this is a very complex it issue. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. There's, there's, 800, people, there's 800 people here. 
<laughs> but your question also goes to how you achieve social change. Like, yes, you need to engage with government, but that's not the start. They're not going to all of a sudden arrive at work and say, yes, we need to address homelessness. How did we get, like I spoke about public yeah. education, the Medicare system, why I sit here as a woman MP. It wasn't because all of a sudden the politicians decided to do the right thing. People literally rattled the chains. They, they, they took action. And that's what, like, it's, it's so fantastic to sit here with 800 plus people. And that voice for action is absolutely vital because the crisis in this country is going to get worse. I've and that's why we need to just really be loud and angry. Just one more, I think just probably the final question we have time for, unfortunately. Um, one of these issues here that's come through as well is quite interesting. Do we find, obviously immigration has been a bit of a political football of late. Is immigration and the overseas student intake causing any housing stress? And how should um, the government, how should Australia respond to those numbers? growing um, rates of immigration, a growing population before, and at the, at the same time in the 50s when we had that rapidly growing population, we had governments that were investing in housing, directly investing in social housing, and people were being housed, and in actual fact, the, um, you know, house prices went down because the rate of housing investment at that time was greater than the rate of population growth. So the problem is not how many people we have, it's about government planning for the amount of people that we have. All right, well thank you very much to our panellists today. Um, obviously there's a jam-packed schedule coming up. Um, I'll just ask, yeah, I'll ask you obviously to thank our panellists here, the Honourable... Just, just, just before you go, um, <laughs> I knew you'd say I, I that. I just had a quick look because I, I was pretty sure David <laughs> Coleman was not in Cabinet. He's an assistant minister. He should have been here. <laughs> <laughs>